deadly early as ever and it's pretty much chucking it down relentlessly but I'm in my waterproof today and there is not a soul to be seen so I'm gonna get stuck into some real intense mud larking let's see what we can find there's a neat little collection of bricks here really warm that looks like a Tudor brick to me And I like this one here with the stripes across it. Most of all, I just like the way they've collected here. I'm heading out to a very particular spot and I'm going to stay there for a while. I'm not going to cover all the zones I normally cover down here. I'm just going to stay in this one spot there's a piece of pottery down here that's just caught my eye so let's try and nab that before the tide comes in here it is look at this how beautiful is that just the remnant of a lady on there it's part of a bigger design of course nothing on the back a really nice piece of tin glaze, elsewhere, but a really tantalising remnant of a bigger picture. Post medieval redware down here. And the reason I'm showing it to you is it's very worn, clearly it's been in the river and out of the mud for a long time. But these, the, this decoration here, is a thumbed decoration. So once the potter has finished constructing the pot, then at the top they'd use their thumb to do this. Sometimes you can spy a nail mark. Could be. This kind of decoration is just so perfect and so simple, manipulated by hand, and it's just really tactile and chunky. I think we may have our first coin. I think we've got it. So I'll let you have a little look. Can you spot a coin anywhere? Okay, I'm going to zoom into it now. There it is. And I'm hoping it's something nice. But it's not that nice. It's a 2007 Tuppence. So there we are, it is a coin. I'm going to stick around this area because there may be some other coiny bits. Wish me luck. This sizeable chunk of glazed stoneware is what's known as a sagar. A sagar is a ceramic vessel which acts as kiln furniture used in the firing of pottery to hold and protect wares from open flame, smoke, gases and kiln debris. Interesting fact, the word sagar is a contraction of the word safeguard. Say it quickly and it's easy enough to see how it came about. What have we got here? Glenboig, Scotland, 1876. 
A sleepy North Lanarkshire village, just 10 miles from Glasgow, is about to blow up big time by becoming the global leading manufacturer of fire bricks. By 1891, 50 brick moulders were producing 100,000 bricks per day. Culture NL Museums, the North Lanarkshire Museums collection say this. In the late 1800s, the small village of Glenboy became the leading manufacturer of fire bricks in the world. Their bricks were used to build the furnaces that fueled the Industrial Revolution. The demand was enormous due to the iron and steel industries. The rich deposits of fire clay found in between the seams of coal produced first-class bricks as they could withstand extremely high temperatures in the furnaces. The company produced a wide range of products, blast furnace blocks, gas fittings, chimney pots, pipes for sewage works, troughs, bricks for coke ovens and much, much more. Greatly sought after, the old works and star works in Glen Boyg had international reputations and their products were exported all over the world. Furnaces in France, Holland, Russia, India, Australia and even the United States were built using Glen Boyg bricks. So this brick has made its way from Glen Boyg in North Lanarkshire to the city of London and in being discarded here on the Thames foreshore, an old fire clay brick has opened the door to a wealth of Scottish social and industrial history that I previously knew little about. And that, dear viewers, is precisely why I do this. I'm a history hunter. Another spot to find for you guys. It's ammunition related. Not a big daddy or a big mama. A little thing. Any luck? Here it is. A little air gun pellet. We all love man-made finds from the foreshore, but it's also important to pay a little attention to those naturally occurring items. I'm talking fish bones. Yep, fish bones. So what's this strangely shaped thing here? It's a nice chunky bisected cod or tuna vertebra. Let's have a closer look at it. Fish bones, mainly vertebrae, like these, are used to this very day in jewellery making. There are plenty available to buy online and you can get those in batches. The vertebra I have here is dark in colour as it is most likely fossilised. Look closely and you can see that holes are made in the centre of the vertebra to allow them to be threaded onto necklaces and bracelets. While I'm on the subject of fish bones, check out this strange little thing I found quite some time ago on the foreshore. Any ideas? It's an otolith, sometimes called an ear stone, and is found in the head of all fish other than sharks, rays and lampreys. This one is most likely from a codfish. It's a calcified structure that sits in the fish's skull just below the rear side of the brain and is used to sense gravity, balance, linear acceleration and sound. Fish have three pairs of otoliths each, one large and two small. They aren't attached to the skull, instead they float around beneath the brain, inside the soft inner ear canal. And there we have it, fish vertebrae and ear stone. That's maybe something you haven't seen before. Two different fragments of roof tile with the different peg holes on. There's one with a square pickle, and here's one with a round pickle. And now I'm looking at all these tiles at the moment, flipping them over, 
because I've mentioned it before, but I would really love to find a tile that has a paw print underneath it. There's a couple of people I know who find loads of them. But in the four years I've been mudlarking, I'm still to find one. This spot is a lovely piece of slipware. Now that's interesting. That looks like a kind of shabbily made piece of slipware. Doesn't slip on there, doesn't look very generous, does it? And in one of my other videos, I did a, a long piece about slipware. So if you're interested, I think it's my last video actually, check that out. I'll put the link up on the screen. Okay, so here's another nice piece of slipware. And I can demonstrate what I mean now with the last piece that I found. I think this is later actually, I don't think this is Staffordshire's slip cone, but the slip that's been applied here, I can feel a, a ridge. So that's what I meant by they've been rather ungenerous with their slip application. of it has changed so drastically in a matter of three weeks. Where all this shingle is, this was pretty much sand and this kind of mud the last time I came. And now there was mud all up the back there. Now this shingle, obviously there's this pottery as well, but this is just sort of piled on in this area. And uh, I'm going to have to wait for it to do its thing and leave again, <laughs> whenever that may be. So I just have to come and check. Sometimes I'll get lucky, sometimes I won't. But it's a really fascinating thing about the river that it moves in big swathes and settles and moves again. All right guys, well a bit of a bizarre thing just happened. I was down here minding my own business. I'm gonna look for my item and Someone yelled over from uh, upstairs there, up on the Thames Park, and asked if I'd found anything yet. I think I was a bit surly with my answer because I just want to get on, so I said no. Um, then he started saying, boy, and I thought, oh dear God, pulled me over to nearer to the back wall. He then threw down this type, designed down the seam, which was nice of him. I suspect that this guy, this mystery pipe thrower, is none other than my namesake on Instagram. There's a chap, I assume it's a chap, who is making these kind of street art things with pipes and bits and bobs he finds on the foreshore. He's making these little installations and putting them around London. And I keep getting tagged into them on Instagram because I am Old Father Thames and he is Old underscore Father underscore Thames, something like that. So if that was you, Old Father Thames, not me, but you, thanks very much for this lovely pipe. Um, very kind of you. All of this area here that you can see now, is chalk. Area. This is known as barge bed and it was a soft surface, soft elevated surface for barges to dock at. Tell you what guys, it really is tough going out here today, not least the weather but it's pretty muddy and sandy. I have just found this tiny object though. It's a piece of letterpress, and you can see there it's lovely and fine. It's an R. I'll keep that piece, that's really nice and chunky, and I'll be able to use it.
You might remember from the video last week I showed you a piece of red ware that had the grey core. Now this one here, you can see it really well. Now this grey core is produced due to heat levels in the kiln. It hasn't been fired all the way through at the same temperature. So there we are. And you can see there also, this helps in dating the very flat T-shaped edge there on the rim. More signs of an old jetty. It's happened again. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder there, uh, there's a chap collecting a Santander bike. So, nice one Santander. If people come out and pick up your bikes that have been chucked on the foreshore, that's cool. Anyway, I was having a chat to him and off he went to get his bike and then he came back and gave me this. A little fragment of pipe stem. So, Thank you, Mr. Sandander Bike Man. That's very nice of you. Um, so I'll keep it, I guess. But uh, yeah, what can we say giving me very pipe? Do I look really forlorn out here? Right, let's see what else we can. I've just turned this Tudor book over and I will be taking this home for my little garden collection. So there. A lovely example of a Tudor brick. Again, I did a big piece about these in an earlier video. I shall put the link to the video up on the screen. There are days where you have surface fine days, days where you have scraping days, days where you have tipping everything over days. This is part of a post medieval colander. Uh, or draining bowl. So that is coming home with me because it's lovely. I've just spotted a piece of that old slag, no sniggering at the back there, um, that comes out of the same spot which is about 100 metres away from here. So I'm guessing that it might be quite eroded now. Nice chunk there though. Looks like a galaxy. See, there's chunks of it here. And I just want to see how eroded it is. Aha, here we are. There's all this patch here. All of this under here. So there's that shiny blue glass slag. But it goes around here, all of this area where I've got my foot, up here, and look, there's just loads of bits of it. All around here, under here, this is all the same stuff. Now what is that? Gosh. Well, that feels like glaze. And that feels like stone. No idea loads of it here. So is this all part of the glass slag as well that's eroding out? Yes, it must be. It's the same core. Look, huge amounts of it. I mean, it is just a waste product, but I find it so fascinating. Maybe that's the wrong thing. I'm not sure I find it fascinating. I find it really attractive. Here's another lovely piece. Look at that. You know what? I've already got a brick in my bag. I'm going to take this home with me because 
as I said, it is attractive. been given another tantalizing clue here. I can see from here that there's some maker's marks on here and there was once a design. I might be able to pull enough information off there to find out what this looked like when it was complete. And the maker, I or L, and W. Right guys, I'm going to be calling it the day pretty soon. It's been unforgiving. It's a punisher of a tide. It didn't go very low, which I expected, I knew that. Um, pretty muddy, pretty sandy. Now is what's known as last knocking. I'm having my final little look about. See if I can spot any last bits and bobs. Part of a Roman box tile underfloor heating system. Nestled in the Thames mud. Uh, no pipe stem, but there is a bowl. No maker's mark. Nice 17th, 18th century pipe bowl. Alright guys, well that's it for today. Thank you for joining me. We found some great stuff and I'll be down here again very soon so I hope you can join me then.